banks get boring, David is back, and we're going to ask, what would Buffett do? You're in the right place, because this is where the money is. I'm Allison Southwick, and I am joined with Bat Kopenheffer and David Hansen. They are finance and banking analysts here at The Motley Fool, and we're going to cover all the big news today in the industry. As always, we start with the headlines. First up. Over at the Wall Street Journal, the headline is City Steps Up Business Exit. Basically, in this story, it's yet another example of how banks are getting out of alternative investments. The, arg uh, the argument in the article is that things like private equity have caused the banks headaches and regular regulatory scrutiny. So in this case, Citi is getting out of some private equity holdings. David, is this a good idea? I think it is. If you're a shareholder today, don't look at it in a vacuum saying that they're exiting this business so that's just less money and it's a totally bad thing. You have to remember that there were costs associated with these investments. There's capital that has to be held against these investments. And like you, you mentioned, the regulatory environment, there's the Volcker rule out there, not totally set in terms of what banks can do, what banks can't do. So banks are kind of just making that, that normal transition to exit these things that don't necessarily make sense from a, profitabil a profitability standpoint, and also that they're going to have a lot of regulatory scrutiny around them. So when I look at this, if you're a shareholder today, I wouldn't necessarily be running for the doors. This isn't what is going to be city city's uh, moneymaker in the future. It wasn't before. It's not going. It wasn't going to be today. So. I think them focusing on their core business is a good thing for shareholders, it's a good thing for the business, it's just a natural progression. So Matt, what about some other banks here that have stepped away from from things like PE and other things that maybe make them more interesting? Before I answer that, let me oh. just point out that I've got on the celebratory bow tie today. This is to celebrate David's grand return. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I think that this is, it, it is, it's a move towards the banks getting more boring, Citigroup in particular has done that. I mean, look at the chief executive spot. You've got Michael Corbat up there. He is not a, a fun and games electricity <laughs> type of guy, but he's a he's a solid banker, and I think uh, a good choice to lead them forward in a in a safe kind of route. the The other thing that that strikes me here is that when we think about the financial supermarket model, there are some advantages to that. There are some advantages to one bank being able to offer a lot of different services. But I think what investors also want to think about is what do the banks do really well? And that's what makes a good business a good business, is that they focus on what they do well and just that. So in terms of private equity and alternative investments, are the big banks really the best in class in those? And when we think of the options available to public market investors today, We've got KKR trading on the public markets. We've got Blackstone trading on the public markets. We've got Carlyle trading on the public markets. These are best of breed in alternative asset management. Even Goldman Sachs, there's more of an argument for, for them hanging on to their alternative investments, but even they've struggled over the years with it. Citigroup, I'm A-OK -okay with them getting out of alternative investments. It's not their bread and butter. It's not where they're going to consistently win. All right, so it sounds like you guys like this move. Mm -hmm. Next up, we are going over to the Financial Times blog, Long Short. The title is The Cape of Less Hope. So what's going on here is that Schiller Cape valuations are looking high, and there's some debate out there about whether this number even matters. So, Matt, before you tell me whether you think it matters, can you briefly explain what this uh, number looks at? Sure. Uh, when we're looking at price to price to earnings ratios, typically it's a the, the current price. If, if we're looking at the S and P 500, would be the current price of the S and P 500 divided by the current or, or the trailing earnings of the index, the companies within the index. What ends up happening though is that over economic cycles, you get these swings up and down. So when we're at, at the peak of an economic cycle, earnings are high, so that denominator is high. The PE is low. It makes stocks look extra attractive right at the time when you might not want to be buying them, right? Because earnings are high and the cycle will change. The opposite is true at the bottom. So what the, what the Schiller Cape seeks to do is it averages out the earnings over a 10-year period. So it takes today's price, divides it by an average of 10-year earnings, and the idea is that you're looking at a, a smoother uh, valuation. And, and supposedly that's, that's better than using a one-year PE. So right now, the Schiller PE is one of the few valuation metrics, one of the few commonly used valuation metrics that makes stocks look expensive. When we look at a variety of other metrics, one-year PE, forward-looking PE, price to cash flow, all of these different measures, stocks look fairly cheap. And so there are some arguments that, well, maybe we shouldn't be worrying about the Schiller PE. I think that's a mistake. 
the FT kind of argues the same thing, that, that it, it's probably a mistake to, to just decide to, to brush it off and overlook it. I, I think we want to keep all of these in mind so that we have a full picture of what's going on. The Schiller PE makes stocks look a little overvalued right now, but not vastly overvalued. And I think what we want to remember is that stocks don't trade like this at a valuation right at the average. They go above the average and then they come back down below the average. So when you're kind of near the average or just a little bit above the average, it's not really a time to freak out. The other thing I'll point out is that one of the big victories for the Schiller PE was back in 2000. The, the valuations of stocks on this CAPE ratio went crazy. They were at historical highs, and that was a stock market bubble. That was a bubble in the stock market. So that was a perfect time to use valuations of stocks as an indicator of what was going to go wrong. If we look back to 2007, the driver of the downturn wasn't really in the stock market. It was in the financial market. It was in the housing market. So you wouldn't necessarily have had a signal from the Schiller PE as much as in 2000. So when we look to today, I think it's hindsight bias to think, well, we're going to look at the Schiller PE, maybe we'll look at housing prices or the changes in housing prices. It's going to be something else. It's probably going to be something else next time around. And we're, we're latched on to these indicators of the previous uh, downturns. Yeah, and the article mentions that the criticism of the CAPE is that it's been showing that it's, the market's overvalued this whole run up. So if you were only focused on that and you weren't invested at all, you would have missed the run-up in the stock market, this bull market, I guess, if you will, that we're on now. So I think the way you have to look at it is never just be markets overvalued, I'm taking my ball and all my money and going home and I'm never buying a stock again. I think what we like to do here at The Fool is really focus on individual companies, finding those good companies. And if the market does fall 30%, again, we... We don't know. The market could fall 30% tomorrow and we could be sitting here and go, all right, that's what and the then market... And Matt's going shopping. That's, <laughs> that's what the market does sometimes. So we're not in the that business... for bow ties. We're not in the business of really trying to predict the timing here. So find these good companies. Stay nimble. If you think the market's a little overvalued, there's nothing wrong with scaling back a little bit and not buying as much. But I would encourage, don't take your ball and go home. I think you should still be out there on the hunt. And if you find something you like, buy You're it. Just mixing metaphors. Yeah, well, <laughs> we're, that's what we do here. You're so, hunting with balls. I don't. I don't. I don't even know what's going on at this point. So uh, I, I would say that's where that I. Lethal that's where I stand ball. on too it. Too much. Too much. You, golf. you can argue all. You can look at tons of different <laughs> metrics and say, well, it's overvalued according to this, undervalued yeah. according to this. Focus on the company and be willing to buy more if, if it does get cheaper for you. Yep. All right. Well, you can take some people to the market, but you can't make them invest. Exactly. How's that for Ooh. mixing in another <laughs> yeah, metaphor? There's, there's just one more. <laughs> I don't know. All right. Next up, we've got uh, from the American. This is over at the American Enterprise Institute. The financial crisis explained. This is a big promise. Why complexity wasn't the problem. So. I think a big excuse people have been using for not investing in banks is that, ah, oh, it's too complex, I don't, don't even bother, just take your ball and walk away from mm -hmm. banks. But as the author in this article argues, iPhones are complex, but we still invest in Apple, as Jamie Dimon famously argued, planes are complex, but we still invest in Boeing. So. So is he right here? Was complexity not the problem? Well, I think that's one of the really good points that comes out of this article. I, there's there's been this 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 theme that that mortgage-backed securities that any sort of structured security that this is all so complex normal people can't understand it wall street shouldn't have been doing it it's really not that complex if you take five minutes to sit down and actually i i'd recommend uh the 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 meat of this article as a good as a good primer on, on how this stuff works it's not all that hard on the other hand as the article points out, if you crack open an iPhone and you look at the innards of that, <laughs> that is mind-bogglingly complex. And it would be hard to sit down and spend a week or a month learning about what everything is within an iPhone and how that all connects. That's complexity. The other thing I'd, I'd point out about this article, though, is that one of the things I see here is the continued process of finger pointing. And the, the article concludes, it says, five years on, it should be obvious that the federal government's well-meaning but misguided affordable housing policies played a decisive role in the crisis. What has continued to go on after the financial crisis is everybody wants to blame somebody else. There's fingers pointing at the banks, there's fingers pointing at the government. I think we just need to get over ourselves and realize that we all played a part in it. It's, it's not this person or that person, this entity or that entity. It's the homeowners. It's the mortgage brokers. It's the banks. It's the government. It's a little bit of everybody. It's the, the rating agencies. 
it, it's a little bit of everybody. We all got carried away and we wouldn't have been able to get to the heights that we did if everybody wasn't buying into this. So I think we just need to stop the finger pointing and, and figure out how we move forward, how we get everybody on, on board or just accept the fact that mania is part of the human condition. I, I, don't, I don't know the answer, but I know that finger pointing isn't the solution. Right. I agree. It's human nature. That's, that's the most complex thing, but it's also the most simple thing. That's what gets you into trouble. That's what creates buying opportunities. That's what the financial crisis was. It was human nature. All right. Well, that covers it for the headlines. So now it's time to take a deeper dive. Uh, as we are all looking forward to, on Thursday, we're having the first ever Motley Fool Financial Stocks Draft. Absolutely. Uh, for fantasy investing, we're going to have a bunch of guys here around the table picking stocks real time, and then we're going to track it in caps. It should be very exciting. <laughs> But before that, we're going to do a little draft preview for bank stocks. We've already covered insurance. Now it's time to talk banks. So first up, I want to know which stocks, Matt, you think are going to get drafted early. Well, I, th I think we have to expect that the, the big four are going to be at or near the top of people's lists. They're certainly near the top of my list. I'm going to guess David's as well. Wells Fargo, JP Morgan, Citigroup, Bank of America. The, the, the returns that, I mean, if you look at Citigroup and Bank of America in particular, the returns that they're earning today aren't that great. I think the, the, the process is rolling along in terms of their businesses being repaired. Meanwhile, valuations are still relatively low. JP Morgan, I, I've talked over and again about how I think they're doing, that bank is doing a great job, has a great collection of businesses, valuation is still low there. Wells Fargo a little bit less so. Great bank, great returns, valuation is a little bit higher. I think one other that might go early because it's, it's been a foolish favorite and is a pick in our rule breaker service is Bank of the Internet. Uh, this has been a, a really hot bank, hot stock, great performer, but it's a little bit expensive now. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be at the top of my list, but I wouldn't be surprised to see it go in the draft. Uh, yeah, just on, on B of I there, I think it's kind of like the Colin Kaepernick of stocks here. It had a great, <laughs> it kind of came out of nowhere. Not a lot of people heard of it. Mm -hmm. Made a run to the Super Bowl there. This thing has just been on a tear, but it is trading at 3.6 times its book value now, which is a little bit rich. So this is one that I think some investors may be reaching into those first couple of rounds, but I'm not sure if he's proved himself, Colin Kaepernick or B of I, in the long run to be a really cornerstone uh, fantasy team or portfolio. But does B of I have a touchdown dance? Not yet, but he, they should. They should. <laughs> they should. Um, so then that covers who you think is going to get drafted early. Do you think there are any here that are going to be overlooked that we're going to see later on in the rounds? Who do you think? I think one, that, one that's potentially overlooked is, is Capital One. We think of Capital One as this credit card company with Vikings and Jimmy Fallon, Elk Baldwin. They're credit card company. That's it. Yeah. But they're much more than that, actually. The credit card business has been... Uh, declining in terms of, not the business been declining, but in terms of how much they make of their net income from the credit card. So they've been diversifying elsewhere into consumer banking via their acquisition of ING Direct and also into commercial banking, so lending to businesses as well. So this is a business that's diversifying. I think the price is pretty attractive and I think when we're talking about banks and previewing banks, I don't think Capital One is top of mind on a lot of people in terms of being a best in breed bank out there. It's still, the, I think, the 12th biggest bank by assets in the country. So it's not a small player anymore. So I think that's one that may be flying under the radar and that I may pick up. Yeah. Right. I, think, How about you, I think both David and I are wrong about who's getting overlooked because I was about to say the exact same thing. I was about to say Capital One. Uh, I, I, won't, I won't reiterate what David said, but it's, it's on my list as a potential early pick. In terms of other, other banks that could get overlooked, I think, I think some of the higher quality smaller banks could potentially, I don't know if I want to say overlooked, but may not get picked up. I, I'm thinking about banks like Cullen Frost, East West Bank Corp, uh, SVB Financial, that's uh, Silicon Valley Bank. These are, these are really well run, high performing banks. The problem is, is that they're all a little bit expensive at this point, particularly when you compare them to the larger banks. So, like I said, I don't know if I want to say that I think they'll get overlooked, but they n might not get picked up. Mm -hmm. But if some of my top picks end up going early and I'm looking for a good bank that, I, that I'd feel very comfortable with over the longer term, those three could be on my list. So then, last question here is, do you guys have like an ace in the hole, the one where if someone takes it before you, you're going to just be crushed and you're, or, or if no one picks it up before, 
you do, everyone's going to be like, oh, genius <laughs> pick. So I don't, we don't have to worry about those guys watching today. So what's your mm. ace in the hole, David? Matt can go first. Matt, oh. what's your ace in the hole? <laughs> you're going to put, you're going to try to steal my pick, aren't you? We'll see. I, I don't think it's, I, I, I was thinking about trying to play coy here, but I don't think it's going to be any surprise that J.P. Morgan is, is near the top of my list. I would actually say that, that Capital One is near the top of my list, too. Those will probably be my, my top targets for, for an early draft pick among the banks. Yeah. I'm going to go with one you guys mentioned in your insurance preview that yet last year, Adrian Peterson, they are saying, this guy's too risky, don't touch him, just stay away. And he turned out to have a great year. Matt mentioned, I think, AIG as some, an insurance stock that had similar characteristics. On the banking side, I'm going to go with Regions Financial. I own it in real money portfolio, but it, it's also on my radar for the draft here. This is one that was beaten down badly after the financial crisis, mainly because of where they were located geographically. They're in the southeast part of the country there, Alabama, Florida, Georgia. Those states got partic hit particularly hard with the housing downturn. Slowly on its way back, finally paid back that TARP money, slowly getting that stigma off of them, that torn ACL stigma is slowly fading for Regions Financial. That, so that's one that I think may be overlooked because it's still a little bit ugly, but I think it has potential. All right, and, I, and really quickly, do you have like a sucker pick where if one of the, one of the guys picks it, you're going to be like, oh man, he got suckered. <laughs> oh, that's a tough, tough question. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. Um, among the big banks, I'd struggle to come up with a, a true sucker pick. I, you know, I don't want to. I don't want to talk down Bank of the Internet at this point because it's been a very good performer. But I just think, in terms of, of future returns, mm -hmm. that that valuation is going to hobble it. So, yeah, I think that's a little bit of a sucker pick at this point. I think it's just too too expensive compared to the other to the other opportunities out there. Do you have a sucker pick? You don't have to. We can move on. I'll save it. I'll, save it. I'll, I'll make fun of them in real time. Okay. I'll, I won't give you any preview. <laughs> all right. So that's all happening here tomorrow, right? Tomorrow. Thursday. So the tomorrow is the big draft day. Uh, so be sure to tune in um, or don't, but you'll be missing out because it should be a lot of fun. <laughs> all right. Now it's time to head to the Twitter. Oh, no. It's not time to head to the Twitter. Oh. No. First up, oh, first Warren. up, we got a game. First okay. up, we're going to have some fun. Uh, what we like to do often is ask ourselves, what would Buffett do? He's such a wise guy. And so today we're gonna, I'm going to ask you a couple different scenarios, and I'm going to ask you, quite literally, what do you think Buffett would do? So the first one is, a trader within Berkshire hides a growing derivative trade that bubbles up to cost the company $6 billion. If this sounds familiar to JP Morgan investors and employees, it should. What should Buffett do? Who wants to go first? Go for it. What would Buffett do? I could take it first. The, Buffett is not these scandal and 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 uh, intrigue. Maybe I could say is not is not an unknown to Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway. We saw it just a few years back with David Sokol. Uh, that was a very unfortunate situation. It wasn't. I, I don't think it ended up being labeled true insider trading. But in any case, the optics of it were not good. This, this, this is not, it, it, it didn't follow the ethos of Buffett. So it's not like he's never dealt with, with bad things going on at Berkshire Hathaway or, or uh, things that go against his keep your reputation uh, aura. In terms of that kind of thing happening, it would be difficult for it to happen at Berkshire Hathaway. The way Berkshire Hathaway is run, the way capital is allocated and that sort of thing, he's sort of the gatekeeper with, with capital allocation. But if that were to happen, I think he would face it head on. He would let go, uh, fire who he needs to fire, get rid of who he needs to get rid of, clean, clean up the house, and, uh, and move on. I mean, what, what, what can you do? I, I think the the wrong approach to it is is trying to cover it up and, and trying to to hide and pretend that it that would that it was okay. I don't think Buffett would do that. And when I look at what J.P. Morgan did, they kind of they were on the borderline there. I think there was a little bit of trying to cover it up. If you if you listen to what Jamie Dimon has to say about it. He wasn't. He, he would say that he wasn't trying to cover it up. He just didn't understand the extent of it at first. And in fact, the the traders close to the trade were trying to cover it up. So there's an argument to be made that maybe Jamie handled it 
just like Warren Buffett would. I would agree. Yeah, first of all, you said if there was a trader inside of Berkshire Hathaway. I don't know if they would classify anyone in, in Berkshire Hathaway as a trader. That's Maybe they call them investors. But yeah, like you said, in terms of the cover-up at J.P. Morgan, it's a fine line. It's not black and white say, oh, they covered it up. They didn't try to cover it up. You don't want to just, anytime something looks like it's going to be potentially bad, you don't want to come out and hold a conference call and say, oh, we screwed up again. Obviously, you want to try to mitigate it to the, be to the best that you can. Maybe the lower level employees that are actually in the news this morning for some not so good things, maybe they tried to cover it up a little bit. But when we look at Jamie Dimon and the senior level uh, that he was at, I don't necessarily think he tried to cover it up. I think he, he did handle it like Warren Buffett would. He, he scheduled a call, a, an unscheduled call. He held it. He said, this is what happened. Move forward. He said, we're going to handle it. We're going to deal with the regulators, and we're sorry. Uh -huh. And I will also point out that it's been said that Warren Buffett is a shareholder, an individual shareholder, not through uh, Berkshire Hathaway, but an individual shareholder in J.P. Morgan, and has repeatedly been very supportive of the way Jamie Dimon has led the bank, even in the wake of the, of the London whale crisis. So I don't think it's crazy to think that <laughs> Warren Buffett would have handled it a sim similar way. Yeah. All right, second one, second and last one. With interest rates still extremely low, are investment properties looking like just too enticing to pass up here? So would he, would he get into investment properties? I'm going to start with you. 99 times out of 100, no. I don't think he would. I'm not going to discount the fact that there still are opportunities in real estate. We don't want to just brush it over and say, oh, real estate's not a good investment. It's not a good long-term investment. There still are good opportunities to buy undervalued land, undervalued properties, and you can make it work. So maybe. Buffett could potentially find one little sliver in there. But on the whole, I don't think this is something he would be interested in. I think he realizes, especially homes, are not necessarily a good long-term investment. I don't think you can expect more than, or I don't think you should expect more than a couple percentage points appreciation over the long haul, basically keeping pace with inflation there over the long haul. I think Buffett would look at it and say, I can find much more attractive returns in the stock market in other things, other investments that I can make with my cash. So I don't think this is something Warren Buffett would do. David can go with the 99 times <laughs> out of 100 thing. I'm just going to go with no. I'm going to go with a plain, good old fashioned no. What, what's so great about Buffett is he knows where his circle of competence is and he knows how to stay within that. He is a, he understands businesses, he understands stocks, he understands how to invest and how to make money investing, how to make money buying other companies. That's what, I mean, even within this, even within the stock market, he understands the certain businesses that he understands. I mean, you look at his, you look at Berkshire Hathaway's portfolio, uh, Wells Fargo, right up at the top, the largest ownership position, Coca-Cola, consumer goods company, American Express, one of the largest holdings, another financial company. He understands consumer facing companies. He understands financial companies. He knows what he knows. That doesn't mean that it's not right for somebody else to go out and, and maybe invest in real estate, but that's the, that's the big caveat if it's within their circle of competence, if they understand the real estate market, if they know how to be a landlord, if they know how to do the repairs needed to, to make a house nicer, to fix it up, to, to flip a house. Otherwise, not so much. How cute would Buffett. that be? You're like, Buffett's your landlord, and you're like, ah, my <laughs> sink's broken, and he shows up with a little wrench. and. He's like, I got it. <laughs> that would little overalls. That would be pretty. Ah. That'd be pretty great. That would be awesome. All right. Well, that's enough for what would Buffett do? Now it's time. Now it is time now to head to the Twitters. <laughs> so first off, we're starting up um, with at jo or with at Mager. This is Joe Mager. He's an analyst for the Motley Fool over at, in Australia. His tweet today is why Combank shares are a time bomb. Um, this is an Australian bank. David, why should I care about right. an Australian bank? Combank, most people probably don't know what that is. That's Commonwealth Bank of Australia, obviously, like you said. Australian bank. So Joe, he links to an article there that says why Combank shares are a time bomb. Doesn't sound great. And I would tend to agree <laughs> with some of, some of the points he makes. This is a bank that's trading at 2.6 times book value. So for com comparison purposes, Wells Fargo is one of the best run banks here some of the highest returns on assets, highest returns on equity, it's trading at about 1.5 times book value. And Commonwealth Bank of Australia, this is one of the big banks in Australia. The US isn't the only country that has these big four banks that kind of dominate uh, the top of the banking industry. Australia, very similar. 
So the banks had a great run. The countries had a great run. They've been riding the coattails of China as China has been expanding the last decade or so. So the bank is trading at a pretty big premium, 2.6 times. Return on assets only around 1%. Not great return on equity, around 15%. So still good. But Joe's arguing that investors are really paying up for the past 10 years. When as an investor, we should be forward looking and be paying up for the next 10 years. What's the profitability look like for this? Australia's been on a great ride as a country. The real estate market also didn't take the hit we did here, obviously. Uh, so if you're looking at international banks at all, just be careful that you're not overpaying. But I think it also does highlight the, the pessimism that's worked its way into a lot of the US banks. I mentioned Wells Fargo. JP Morgan, similar story. The valuations of these are just rock bottom when you compare them to Canadian banks, Australian banks. Yes, there's headwinds in the US banking system and the US economy, but just for some comparisons, it's it's an interesting contrast there. Yeah. All right, next up we've got at hardcore value. I am a Burke B shareholder, but if you drink Coke, diet or classic, on a daily basis, you're making a pretty questionable life decision. So uh, Coke is the second largest holding by Berkshire. It's second to Wells Fargo. Matt, you're a healthy guy. And so how, like, how do you approach investing in stuff that isn't necessarily that healthy? Do you think it's a good move? I, I think everybody's got to have their own approach, know where they draw the line for themselves. For, for some people, it's just if it's, if it's legal and if it's a well-run business, they're OK with it. And I'm not, I'm not here to change anybody's mind about that sort of thing. Personally, there are certain companies that I just don't want as part of my portfolio. For instance, I, I don't invest in cigarette companies. I just, and, and there's a good argument that Coca-Cola may not be all that different. That maybe a McDonald's, which is part of my portfolio, may not be all that different. The health impact of, of sugar and high fat foods are awful. but. That, that's, where, that's where I draw the line, and I, and I think it's a personal question for everybody. As far as me, and as far as me being a, a, a healthy guy, I still make a lot of pretty questionable decisions, and drinking soda is not the least among them. And some people would say that the amount of running that I do is a questionable health decision. So <laughs> who knows? Who knows? It's, it, one day you eat something, and it's the, the magic food, and the next day that's what's going to kill you. So I try not to worry too much about that kind of stuff. David, do you think at all about unhealthy food, and is it a no-no for you? Not as much on the food perspective, but when I saw this tweet, it reminded me of a conversation we had a couple weeks ago about mortgage insurance. So when, when a, someone goes out to get a mortgage, they don't quite have enough for the down payment, so the LTV is a little riskier. Uh, the bank uh, forces them to get mortgage insurance on that. And we are just wondering, does that business make sense, the fact that there's a lender out, or a borrower out there that's just not quite good enough to get the loan, but they need to go get insurance. Is that really a sustainable business model over the long haul when you're giving insurance to someone who is risky by definition because the bank would not give them a loan? So that's a business that I'm not necessarily jazzed up to go, go out and buy. Obviously, it was crushed during the, the housing crisis, and a lot of these stocks have made a run back. A company like Radian has been on a tear the last year or so. Fire. It's, it is on fire. Fuego. Um, so when I just look at the business, it's, I don't, it's not something that I feel warm and fuzzy about. I guess you can make the argument that they're making home ownership available to a lot of people that couldn't otherwise. But from an investor's perspective, this isn't something that I'm very, very excited about. And I, I think that's, I I think that's a business from. question, though, more than a moral question. I understand where you're coming from, but I, you know, if they want to, if they want to do that, if they want to go into that business, I say, I say, fine. I don't have any, I don't have any problem with them doing mm -hmm. it, and I don't think it's a, a health thing. Maybe an economic health thing. You could make that argument, but I think that's more of I'm concerned about the the future of that business as opposed to I'm concerned about the 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 health or the moral aspects of the business. But although soda just, soda has come under fire, obviously lately, and they've proven to be soda's always under fire. They're always under fire. So that is a, that is I thank guess that you, would thank be you, Michael Bloomberg. that would be part of uh, someone's investing thesis probably if if soda is going to go the way of the dodo, which we all know you no, don't mess with big no. soda, right? Soda's never going no, away. Never, you know, no. They're still going to be here in five years, <laughs> we can say. All right, last one. TD Ameritrade yelling, booyah, is a perfectly acceptable way to finish a trade. 
Do you have any trade celebrations? I'm so glad that at The Motley Fool we are long-term investors, um, and so I don't have to hear booyah a lot every day. <laughs> but do you guys have a way that you celebrate a, a big win? Just internally, say a little prayer. <laughs> say a little prayer for the next five, ten years. Five, ten years, not five, ten minutes. It's all about yelling. hope for you. Yeah. Oh. It's all about hope. That's how, you're, that's how so your investments far, so work good. out. It, uh, it can't hurt to have a little hope <laughs> in there. But no, not, definitely not yelling booyah every five, ten minutes, although I'm sure there are a lot of people are doing that out there, which makes TD Ameritrade very happy right. through their commissions. So no, don't have a, a big celebratory chant. What about, about you? you? I would say that it's something along the lines of, <sighs> because... If I'm doing it right, and I'm not always doing it right, but if I'm doing it right, there's a lot of work that goes into any any investment that I'm making. And so after I've busted my brain for all of this time getting ready and, and getting set and making sure that, that everything lines up the, the way I want it to, mm -hmm. click the button, make the trade, <sighs> <laughs> done. And then I have a cup of coffee or something to eat. Right, so in the investment banking world, they they uh, celebrate, you know, the end of a of a good trade with a bang, and we celebrate a big win with a little bit of a whimper. It sounds <laughs> like, or bowl of cereal. Well, that, that can be a question to our, our viewers out there. They can respond to our Twitter handle. There you go. There TMF you go. Financials. How do you, how do you celebrate financials. your trades? There you go. Yes. All right. At, at TMF Financials, how do you celebrate your trade? We want to hear about it. Or your successful long-term investing. Yes. Strategy, either one. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that covers it for us today. Uh, we will see you back here tomorrow for the great big stocks, financial draft, fantasy. Fantasy guys, stock draft. Guys, we'll have a fantasy good name stock for draft. You. Thank you. <laughs> Sports ball games. <laughs> uh, we will see you back here tomorrow on This Is Where the Money Is.